Good evening. I'm Jeremy Travis, uh, president of John Jay College, and it's my honor to welcome you to the John Jay Justice Award Ceremony for 2012. We're gathered here tonight to celebrate justice and to honor four individuals for their remarkable achievements. Tonight we honor the late Justice William O. Douglas, Vivian Nixon, Dr. Hawa Abdi, and Harry Belafonte. The John Jay Justice Award is given to those who, like the ancient philosophers, understand that it is justice that serves as a ligament that holds civil society together. Our honorees have shown a lifelong commitment to this idea and have demonstrated it with their words and their actions. They have set the examples for future John Jay students and indeed for all of us with their own strength, benevolence, and dedication to human rights. And tonight we come together to honor these individuals for their achievements in pursuit of justice. Before we begin our ceremony, I would like to recognize two trustees of the John Jay College Foundation. I'm sad to acknowledge that this past week we lost a valued member of our board, Mr. George Friedman, who contributed his advertising genius to the transformation of John Jay and for whom the Justice Awards was one of his favorite events. Please join me in a moment of silence in the memory of George Friedman. Thank you. Tonight, I'd also like to recognize the contributions of another trustee, Mr. Richard Tarlow. The John Jay Justice Award was initiated in 2009 by a gift from Mr. Tarlow. We're fortunate that Dick is with us here tonight. Dick, I can't see where you are, but I know you're here. Uh, please stand so we can thank you for your invaluable contributions to the college. There he is. <laughs> So in appreciation of uh, his support and our commitment to the Justice Award tradition, we're opening tonight's ceremony with a retrospective film that shows the last three years of the Justice Award. for their courage, their clarity of purpose, and their generosity of spirit. You are true champions of justice. We are here tonight to honor and to celebrate three such rivers of hope and energy and daring. When each of us in this audience sees that more and more we are linked as human beings and not ranked, we are seeing the work of Mary Robinson. I came all the way from Dublin this morning, and I'm very pleased to see the Irish flag beside the United States flag. The Talmud teaches us that whoever rescues a single life earns as much merit as though he has rescued all the world. Every time an innocent person is convicted, the person who really committed the crime is out there free to commit more. We are custodians of the spirit of righteousness, of the spirit of equal-handed justice. When everyone called her crazy or fool, when people told her not to risk her career, for one more countless, nameless, black young man, she did not waver. And I looked at her and I said, well, we just have to get the law changed, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> and I kept saying to myself, how is it that our society thinks that this is okay, that this is right? that somehow with all the advances we have, we have not figured a way to work with families. <laughs> a 
thousand men will march to the mouth of a cannon where one man will dare espouse an unpopular cause. You never stay long celebrating your moments of victory because immediately after this ceremony, you'll see some horrifying story about a woman that has been battered, a girl that has been raped, a boy that has been given AK-47 and asked to kill his entire family to show his loyalty to some madmen. Just mention the name Marion Wright Edelman and I shall be wherever you want me to be. Her treatment of women, she got heckled by an old white man in the audience who said to her, old slave woman, don't care anymore about your anti-slavery talking for an old flea bite. And she snapped back at him and said, that's all right, Lord willing, I'm going to keep you scratching. Just a few months ago, she survived an acid attack. And a few weeks ago, uh, some of her staff were beaten up on the road. Another was purposefully run over. When each one of us decide that we will not be tolerant to any form of violence to any human being in this world, to that day, I dedicate this award. Thank you. you can call me back next year for another award because I'm keep <laughs> So let's get started. So this is an interesting time of year. I'm not talking about the Yankee game tonight. <laughs> it is an election season. We have a debate later this evening, and we thought it would be fitting, not knowing about the debate, to honor one of the great defenders of our Constitution by presenting a award for justice to the late Supreme Court Associate Justice, William O. Douglas. You see, the, the distinct, distinctive thing about the court in its history is that it's a circle of men with fierce ideological differences, fierce, with every man willing to die for his point of view, <clears throat> but as a group, harmonious, which is unusual to, to find. Would you say today it's harmonious? Yes, it's harmonious. When he was appointed by President Franklin D. Roosevelt, William O. Douglas was among the youngest ever to serve on the Supreme Court. Raised in poverty near Yakima, Washington by a single mother, he came east upon admission to Columbia Law School, arriving on the streets of New York with no money. To pay tuition, he cobbled together part-time jobs and academically soon made his reputation as an exceptional legal mind. His mastery at the practice of business law earned him an appointment to head the Securities and Exchange Commission to shake up corrupt practices on Wall Street. He was offered the job of heading Yale's law school, but President Roosevelt steered him instead to the high court. His first week on the job brought a case before him concerning his and fellow justices' salaries. Should they be subject to tax on their own income? Previous courts had construed the Constitution to exempt them. And the um Youngest, uh, after the discussion, the youngest uh, justice in service uh, votes first. And the, he was turned to me and he said, Douglas, how do you vote? And I said, I vote to reverse. And uh, that that's the way the court went. And as I made the little entry in the docket sheet, I said to myself, young man, you've just voted yourself first class citizenship. And I decided that if you're going to pay taxes like everybody else, that you should be a citizen like everybody else. Plunged into World War II, Douglas was swayed in some early decisions by senior views of the court. One far-reaching decision, affirming the government's right to detain Japanese Americans in internment camps, he soon after publicly regretted. And that regret bolstered the vigor he brought to defending civil liberties for the rest of his life. Spanning America's critical decades, from the Cold War and anti-communist fervor, the civil rights movement, 
and the Vietnam War protests, Douglas's opinions reflected his strong view of due process guaranteed by the Bill of Rights. The right to equal protection under the law. The right to not self-incriminate. The rights to privacy. For his outspokenness to make the court more an organ of the people, detractors branded him an activist judge, not least for his lack of reverence toward precedence in the law. Well, uh, I've always thought that uh on a constitutional decision uh, that uh, stare decisis, that is, the established law, was really <clears throat> no sure guideline. Because what did the guys who, the judges who sat there in 1875 know about, yeah. say, electronic surveillance? Yeah. They didn't know anything about it. Or television. Why take, uh, why take their wisdom? Um, <clears throat> that's why I once said to the consternation of a group of lawyers that I'd rather create a precedent and find one. Uh, because the creation of a precedent in terms of the modern setting means the uh, adjustment of the Constitution to the needs of the time. Many of his opinions, particularly in dissent, made as much news as those that prevailed. In Sierra Club versus Morton, in which the environmental group lost its case against development, he wrote that if the Sierra Club had no standing, then perhaps standing ought to be redefined. He wrote, the critical question of standing would be simplified and also put neatly in focus if we fashioned a federal rule that allowed environmental issues to be litigated in the name of the inanimate object about to be despoiled, defaced, or invaded by roads and bulldozers, and where injury is the subject of public outrage. While the Sierra Club lost the battle, Douglas's dissent empowered the legal victories that won the war to give standing to American wilderness worthy of protection. Well, you need the, you need the week to think about these problems, but you can be hiking while you're, you don't need can to stop Can you do that? Thinking. Can you keep the facts of a specific complicated case in your head as you're walking through the woods here, for example? Oh, sure. Those are, that's the best longer. way to solve a problem if you're confused. <clears throat> but I tell my... Uh, when I talk to lawyers, that you never confuse if you read the Constitution the right way. I'd like to call to the podium Kathleen Stone Douglas, Justice Douglas's widow, to accept the Medal for Justice in his name. Oh. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Well, just <laughs> so I'll say a few things. <laughs> Miss Douglas, your late husband, Associate Justice William O. Douglas, who served 37 years on the Supreme Court, the longest tenure of any justice, left a lasting legacy that has strengthened our democracy. He will always be remembered as an unflinching defender of the First Amendment, a far-sighted jurist who in Griswold clearly articulated our constitutional right to privacy, a fearless advocate for our civil liberties, a prescient legal theorist who foresaw the need to protect our environment, and a great American who, against persistent political attacks, defended the independence of the judiciary. So we are honored to present you, out of respect for his legacy, the John J. Justice Award. Mr. President and honored guests, uh, on behalf of my late husband, I am very, very proud to accept this award. He would be, for at least two reasons, the first is the company that we are pleasured to keep tonight. And uh, especially Mr. Belafonte, whom he knew and greatly admired, and whom I've met many more years ago than I currently admit to. <laughs> <laughs> but the principal reason is that, as you know, the court has no administrative or enforcement arm. And as a civil right, political right, individual right is secured, and that is not unimportant, 
or obviously happens spontaneously, but as it is secured, it needs to be enforced. And if he were here tonight, he would have expressed what he has expressed to me many times. What happens afterwards? How, how long does it take for people to go to trial? Are the trials fair? Are people well represented? In prisons, what is the role of mental health uh, uh, services? And, and should there be more? Are sentences too long? How are we integrating people in a prison system back into society? How do we make the, the criminal justice system something that if an individual comes in contact with it in the ideal way, he or she is better for the experience? Um, this is the role of the John Jay College, and training the public for justice is the glue that holds us together as a society. The better it is executed, the more justice there is in the land. And um, therefore, on his behalf, and because of the wonderful work by the alumni of this organization, the current students who are going out, I hope to want to change the world. I thank you. I made a mistake. I broke the law. I went to prison. The day comes when I am released. But once out, where am I? I no more belong to society than I did as a prisoner. I am ostracized, shamed. So again, I break the law. I go to prison. Not a typical woman incarcerated in a state prison, Vivian Nixon had grown up in a working-class two-parent home, had a good education till high school in an affluent suburb on Long Island. But like many, she made some serious mistakes due to addiction and depression, and a nonviolent offense landed her in prison for a three to seven year sentence. In the Bedford Hills Correctional Facility, she saw a chance to turn her life around by signing up for the college courses taught there. But just before they were to start, she was transferred upstate to another facility where no courses were offered. In 1994, the whole idea of educating prisoners was coming under assault. The so-called Violent Crime Control and Law Enforcement Act doubled down on prison building while gutting college programs for prisoners. In 1994, there were 350 college programs teaching 40,000 inmates. A year later, there were fewer than 12. Ignored were studies showing college in prison kept up to a third of prisoners from repeat offending. And not in the reckoning was the fact that the maximum Pell Grant cost the country $5,500 per year and a prisoner $51,000. On the inside, Vivian grew to know women who had no future, for whom prison was the third strike after poverty and illiteracy. She began tutoring to help give them a chance. Days before her own release, she was handed a brochure about going to college through a group called the College and Community Fellowship. CCF is a nonprofit that helps women with past criminal convictions pursue higher education, foster community, become leaders, and grow in artistic expression. As one of its first fellows, just three years out of prison, Vivian graduated with a bachelor's in human services administration. A few years later, Vivian was leading the organization and targeting the hurdles of a world reluctant to accept individuals with criminal records. One of the biggest components of our work is the community building aspect. The women who come to us to, to get help to go to college develop a community amongst themselves. She brought focus to six things. No single factor matters more than higher education, which can remake, empower, and persuade. Take control of your finances. Live smart and within your means. Change your circle of influence. The crowd that got you into prison won't help keep you out. Get a job. Make a good first impression so that the felony conviction 
doesn't predefine you in the eyes of an employer. Five, and perhaps most importantly, let go of the guilt and the shame. As a reverend of the African Methodist Episcopal Church, Vivian believes in redemptive power. Lastly, what you achieve, you pass on. Mentoring others to create a never-ending chain of positive energy that puts opportunity over punishment. In partnership with programs such as John Jay's Prisoner Reentry Institute, CCF has helped women like Leslie Campbell, 41, who served two years for assault, to graduate magna cum laude from John Jay College with a bachelor's degree in forensic psychology, and then to go on to pursue a master's, which she will earn in 2013. In 10 years, CCF has grown from an organization with a mere two funders and two staff to over 20 institutional funders and 12 staff. Its participants have earned 126 bachelor's degrees, 43 associate degrees, 57 masters, and one doctorate. Of more than 300 enrolled, only four have returned to prison. One day soon, Vivian hopes to bring the mission back within the prison walls through CCF's joint leadership of the Education Inside Out Coalition. Among its goals is restoring Pell Grants for prisoners' education, which Senator Claiborne Pell himself explicitly intended. It takes less than one-tenth of one percent of the Pell Grant budget with immeasurable returns to society. The President is intent on promoting education and raising the level of education for all Americans, Vivian says, and people who are or were once in prison are still Americans, as far as I know. I want every woman involved in the criminal justice system to have opportunities to recapture the dream she had when she was young. Good evening. It is my extreme honor tonight to present this award to Vivian Nixon. Uh, CCF and other organizations like it have proven that the impact of education in prison or directly following prison diminishes and eradicates any possibility of recidivism. And if education is the vehicle for success, then the fuel is faith, faith in God, faith in humankind and faith in a society that truly believes in second chances. When Vivian Nixon was interviewed for an Open Society Fellowship, which she received, someone asked her, why do you want to do this? You are going into a field where your own conviction and record will be part of all that you do. It will always be there. And her response was, I have an obligation to show others and help others to do this more than an obligation, it has been her calling. And it is a better world because of her work. Congratulations, Vivian. So I'm delighted to present the 2012 John Jay Medal for Justice to my friend Vivian Nixon. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I was backstage and talking to President Travis and saying that I was nervous because I was trying to figure out how to thank as many people possible in the fewest words possible. And he said, just say, thank you all, wherever you are. <laughs> thank you all, wherever you are. But in particular, I must um, bring attention to the fact that College and Community Fellowship really does believe in community. And community is the most important aspect of what we do. And the only reason that this organization is able to receive the attention it is receiving, the only reason I'm able to stand here and graciously accept this magnificent award is because of a community of people who have been there, both for me and for the organization. My family who modeled justice for me from the very early years, 
all of the mentors I've had in my life, the colleagues who also do this work, every one of whom is eligible to receive this award as much as I am, and of course, the CCF community, the board members, the staff, and the magnificent students that make the work we do um, so successful and such a beacon of hope for the world. And that is the theory of change at College and Community Fellowship, hope. That hope drives so many things in a person's life. And if, if there are any College and Community Fellowship students and alumni here tonight, I would like you to stand and be recognized. These are the women who provide hope for themselves and hope for so many who come after them. I believe in hope, not in optimism. As Cornel, Cornel West has said, optimism requires evidence that you should have a reason to believe that things are gonna turn out all right. These women and all the women that I work with every day had no evidence to believe that things were gonna turn out all right. But without evidence, they strove ahead. They went to college. They believed in themselves and they believed in the possibility of change with no evidence. And therefore, with that hope, we continue on to believe that as an organization, we can not only individually accomplish our goals of higher education, but bring back that opportunity to everyone who would seek it through Pell Grant restoration in every prison across the United States. We are... We as an, as an organization and I as the executive director of the organization are humbled by this award and grateful for this award. We appreciate you, President Travis, for the nomination. We appreciate all of our colleagues in the field fighting for justice. Thank you.
Somalia. Still large in the memories of many Americans is the Black Hawk Down incident in Mogadishu in 1993, in which 18 Americans died. Most don't know that since that time, and for over 20 years, Somalia has been without a functional government, longer than any other country today. Ongoing warfare between Christian Ethiopia and Islam in Somalia, and between sects of Islam itself, supported by proxies outside the country, including the U.S., have reared two generations of militias, child soldiers whose fathers were child soldiers, culture and tradition severed, education lost. For lack of protection, international aid workers left the country. Rampant food shortages became the warlord's weapon of choice. Water cost $10 a barrel, an unimaginable sum for Somalis. Ill-timed rains and droughts decimated herds, leading to wholesale famine. Along the Afguya Road, just west of Mogadishu, one woman, a single mother with two daughters, set up a small health clinic on her family's ancestral farmland. She'd been raised to believe in herself, educated, and trained in medicine on a Soviet-era scholarship in the Ukraine. Returning home, she became Somalia's first female gynecologist. Her name was Dr. Hawa Abdi. Her clinic grew to a hospital then swelled to a camp for internally displaced persons, which described most of Somalia's population. When demand grew, she sold her family's savings in gold to support it. Yet the famine overwhelmed them. Dr. Hawa would help to bury each of its 10,078 victims in a mound within the camp's borders. Before long, 90,000 people, a full 1% of the entire population, lived in Hawa Abdi village. She and her daughters saw 500 patients per day. Compared to the surrounding chaos, the camp was a haven and an affront to the Islamist militias. The day arrived when youths brandishing AK-47s demanded control of the hospital and camp from the women. Dr. Hawa confronted them. Kill me first before you kill my patients. I may be a woman, but I have worked for this country for 20 years. What have you done? The next day, 750 gunmen surrounded the camp and held Dr. Hawa captive in her house. When refugee women by the thousands rose to protect her, the militia stood down. If Somalia is a stateless pawn of other powers, Hawa Abdi village today radiates a state-like will to self-sufficiency. In four areas, Dr. Hawa and her daughters Dika and Amina work to build a microcosm of the promised society. The camp is rethinking agriculture organically with companionable crops aimed at producing a steady local food source to meet the challenge of climate change. It is weaning itself off of diesel generators and engineering solar alternatives to power the entire camp. And while keeping them running is a constant challenge, drilled wells provide clean water to Somalis at no cost. Predominantly women and children, the camp tolerates no spousal abuse, locking up offenders. The Wakaf Diblawe Primary School has begun educating what children it can, a first small step toward freeing the next generation from the cycle of violence to be capable citizens of a post-war state. And the hospital still brings crucial health care to all, regardless of clan, saving lives, and bringing new ones into the world. Even so, the camp's 15,000 children remain vulnerable to famine and the diseases it brings. The mortality rate has been slowed, not stopped. Against brutality and the world's indifference, Hawa Abdi village endures. As Mama Hawa affirms, women can build stability. We can make peace. When I first met Dr. Hawa Abdi, that astonishing woman that you have just seen on the screen and heard her story, I was as humbled and inspired as I'm sure all of you were just watching what we just saw. In fact, I could hardly believe my ears when she told me that 92,000 people were living on her farm. She said it in such a calm, matter-of-fact way that I thought I must have misheard. But as I have got to know her, I've seen how seemingly superhuman feats 
are almost daily routine for Dr. Hawa and her daughters. And I now understand exactly why she's become known as being equal parts Mother Teresa and Rambo. <laughs> Saving the lives of sick children, fighting off armed rebels, all take place in the course of a single day if your name is Dr. Hawa Abdi. We were so privileged to have her take the stage at the Daisy Beast 2011 Women in the World Summit uh, two years ago. Hawa enthralled us all with the details of how she created her civil society from the ground up. The Hawa village is such an incredible example of what women are able to do when the men leave a vacuum because of violent conflict and war. When we asked her to come back again to our summit last year, she was unable to do so because, again, she was under threat of being displaced from their home. Once again, the camp was under siege. Part of her land had been stolen, and 400 families had once again been forced to move. Worst of all, hundreds of children from the camp were being made to attend rallies by al-Shabaab and al-Qaeda. It's almost as if plague after plague, challenge after challenge, confronts this heroic woman and her two daughters. Famine, disease, civil war, Al-Qaeda, it is an endless wave, a cycle of violence and terror and tri tribulation. The tensions and dangers have never been more grave for Dr. Howard, her, her daughters, and the tens of thousands of Somalis in their care. More recently, headlines coming out of Somalia have been different. Three decades of war is coming an end, to an end, and there is a fledgling new government in Mogadishu. But even as Somalia hopes for a brighter future, the trials that lie ahead of Dr. Hawa Abdi are enormous. A couple of weeks ago, fierce fighting between the government forces and rebels spilled out of Mogadishu and towards Hawa's camp. Her daughters and the hospital staff led thousands of people away from the camp out of harm's way and towards temporary shelters just outside the green zone in the capital. There, from nothing, they set up a new clinic so they could continue to offer treatment for the tens of thousands of people still in their care. Meanwhile, with the camp all but empty, fighting and looters have taken their toll, and the all-important water pumps and generators have been badly damaged. No one can live there until they're repaired, and without water, the crops are in danger once more. And so on this very night, 40,000 of Hawa's children are waiting to return home, and Hawa is there with them, that's why she's not here, providing leadership and comfort. She has come through drought, flood, and famine. She's tackled outbreaks of cholera and pneumonia, run out of money, medicines, and personnel, but she's never given up on her people or on her humanity. And for all of this, we honor her tonight with the John Jay Medal of Justice for her unwavering spirit to bring peace to her people. Her remarkable and brave daughter, Dr. Deko Muhammad, is here tonight to accept the award on her mother's behalf. Deco, I have also got to know over the last three years and am very personally fond of. She's a hero in her own right. She's dedicated her professional and personal life to supporting her mother and her efforts, to safeguarding the well-being of the camp and its people. She's a teacher, a doctor, and protected thousands of her fellow Somalis. And we are so privileged to have her here with us tonight to accept the award on behalf of her heroic mother, Dr. Hawa Abdi. honored that you're here with us tonight and present this award for the work that your mother does and that you do and that so many others do in Somalia. And uh, we are inspired by her example and uh, inspired by your presence. Congratulations. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm deeply honored and to be here tonight with you with this prestigious award, and I'm honored to present this to my mother as you present to me, and I will pass your words to her. Thank you for all we are just trying to do as much as we can every morning waking up and have a justice in Somalia. Without justice, there is no peace. So our small village, we forcing a justice, that's how we have a peace and um, function in our small village we call Hawa Abdi and Woman Village. So please continue to acknowledge the justice in the world, support the justice 
educate and spread peace comes with justice. Thank you. You can aspire to and attain anything, but never awaken in a day without something in your agenda to help set the course for the undermining of injustice. His mother's words. Working as a maid, she raised her sons in Harlem, sent them for a time to live back in Jamaica. The grueling life he witnessed there, with relatives still laboring under colonial conditions, never left him, nor did the songs. As a janitor's assistant in New York, by chance, young Harry Belafonte was given a free ticket to the American Negro Theater. The voice of social truth and power rang out on that stage, winning him over for life. And then came his own voice. Inspired by an older generation of performers, he looked to his family's folk tradition. Pray what I say, and please listen when I say, she's smarter than the man in every way. That's right, the woman is smarter. Finding him backstage at the village vanguard, his idol, Paul Robeson, encouraged Harry, get them to sing your song, and they'll want to know who you are. And slowly they did. He won a Tony Award on Broadway, and performed on tour with a musical review that took him through the American South for the first time. I remember getting off the bus to go to the bathroom, and uh, as I walked into the men's room, I heard a voice behind me that says, you let go or drop, you're a dead nigger. And I turned around and took a look, and there was a state trooper. And I looked at him, and the humiliation of it, and the... And the I mean, there was, I never had a feeling like that before in my life. Not long after, in a theater in Richmond, Harry created a stir. One of the men said, you sure made history in Richmond tonight. And Harry says, what? What did I do? 
He said, you held a white woman's hand in a segregated house and nothing happened. He was just getting started. Acting in Hollywood films brought him acclaim. But for more independence, Harry founded his own production company that squarely took on racial themes. Politically, he soon found himself to be a key endorsement sought by Senator John F. Kennedy. Whether it's in the field of civil rights, better minimum wages, better housing, better working conditions, jobs, I stand for these things. As Martin Luther King's friend and confidant, he brought the nation's leading actors and performers on the scene at its pivotal moments. I just want to say to you how much we are indebted to my dear and a friend, Harry Belafonte. In summer of 1964, he convinced friend Sidney Poitier to join him on a tense journey to Greenwood, Mississippi, to help the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee get out the vote at a time when blacks were routinely threatened, beaten, and killed for speaking out. To further encourage the embattled SNCC student activists, Harry raised the money to take them to Africa's Guinea. There they were received by the country's president and were honored as they had never dreamt possible. Artistically, Belafonte reached across the divide with hit after hit, bringing the vitality and rapture of folk tradition to the mainstream, winning top 40 gold. Lots of chocolate for you to eat. Lots of coal, making lots of heat. Papa Nagila, Papa Nagila, Papa Nagila, then Mr. Khan. For his original television specials, he became the first African-American to win an Emmy, and when sponsors balked at the racial diversity of his cast, would not concede an inch. Beyond the U.S., he drew focus continually to Africa, starting with programs that brought Kenyans to the U.S. for education, among them Barack Obama Sr. Responding to hunger in Ethiopia in 1985, he spearheaded USA Africa's world galvanizing event, We Are the World. In its aftermath, he personally took part in the food and medical relief it made possible. And in South Africa, having fought it since long before the tide finally turned on apartheid, he embraced the day when he could personally arrange a freed Nelson Mandela's first trip to America. Back home, Harry's direct immersion in the problems of gang violence and the endemic cradle-to-prison pipeline for minorities has only strengthened his resolve never to rest, never to blink, over gains won against injustice. The voice and the calling do not stop. Belafonte, your very name means beautiful fountain. You are a man whose lifelong work we honor tonight. You have always dreamed and dreamed big. And you brought those dreams to reality as a voice of justice. You have always understood the nature of true justice, which reflects the wisdom of the inward man who cares about humanity. From the beginning of your career as singer and actor, you understood the responsibility and potential power of your artistry and fame as a tool for good in the world. You have shown that you have never feared to speak truth to power. My friend, you have taken the risks to fight for our humanity, and you continue to be victorious 
as a fearless critic and a voice for human rights. Once you dared to say that the Bush administration suffered from arrogance wedded to ignorance <laughs> and that its policies around the world were morally backed up. Oh, you made, you made some people mad. <laughs> but some more applauded and some others even wept at your courage. Bello Harry, beautiful Harry. You did not merely talk ethics in using your art for justice during the Civil Rights Movement. You saw the need and you were there in person to help. Most people today may not remember that in the 1950s, you, Harry Belafonte, bailed Martin Luther King out of the hell of Birmingham City Jail. You provided, <laughs> you provided for King's family because that great man only made $8,000 per year as a pastor. And you raised thousands of dollars to release other civil rights protesters. You, Harry, financed the Freedom Riders, supported voter registration drives, and helped to organize the March on Washington in 1963. During Freedom Summer of 1964, you bankrolled the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And because of your good work, you were suspect as to those who fought against true justice. Only a strong ethical movement led by unselfish and moral citizens can rescue us from catastrophe and lead us toward a better life for all. We can only go forward when individuals like you dare to set a new tone of mind, a tone independent and in opposition to the general thinking, a tone which will influence the majority and strengthen its character for good. Harry, you have lent your ethical voice to this struggle for more than half a century. Harry, beautiful Harry, you have shown the courage, the friendship, the strength to encounter that which is wrong and unjust. You are brave in peril, constant in tribulation, temperate in wrath, and modest in good fortune. Your life has made a profound difference in millions, maybe billions of lives worldwide. We are humbled to honor you and your just work in this city, this evening, in this place. You are a beacon of the just light. Langston Hughes said it best, bring me your dreams, you dreamer. Bring me all your heart melodies that I may wrap them in blue cloud cloth away from the two rough fingers of the world. You have taught us to keep our dreams of justice alive and to forever fight to protect the dream. The world is better for one man, this man, you, Harry, beautiful Harry Belafonte.
Mr. Harry Belafonte, it is my privilege to present to you the 2012 John Jay Medal for Justice, and we thank you for being here. I have no idea how often I've stood on the stages of the world to not only entertain and delight audiences, or hopefully delight audiences, <laughs> but also share the evening honoring great moments in history and great people. And uh, we often hunt for words that are going to be froth with uh, beauty and distinction and um, all that seems to elude me at the moment because I'm truly, truly overwhelmed and honored by this moment. Thank you, President Travis, for what you do and for what John Jay College does. When people ask, where are the young and what are happening to the voices uh, that will speak against the injustices we're experiencing, I see there are a thousand points of light in which each represents voices that are rich with purpose and spirit, and many of them reside at John Jay College. Often I've come here, and uh, not only to honor others, but to also speak in the classrooms and to have exchanges with students, and it has been an experience beyond my, my ability to describe. When Dr. King talked about our future, I look into the faces of the young men and women that I meet here at John Jay College and understand that these were who he was talking about. To also have the opportunity to be sharing an evening in the memory of a man who was a huge force in all that we did during the Civil Rights Movement, to once again have the opportunity to share a moment with Kathleen Douglas Stone, the wife of the late Justice William O. Douglas, is in itself its own reward. He was a great force, he was a friend. I met him through Eleanor Roosevelt, who thought that if we could engage him and partake of his wisdom, we might be able to find ways in which to strengthen our strategies and our struggle for justice during the civil rights movement. No small player in those efforts no small player in the analysis and the acceptance of assessments of things we had to do through Dr. King's vision. Uh, they were all wonderfully embodied in the things that Bill Douglas did, not only on the bench as a jurist, but what he did in his private life to counsel us, to embrace us, and to give us the benefit of his remarkable humor. To see you again and to be one of the honorees to share this evening with him is quite stunning. To my fellow honorees, uh, I am delighted. I've been to Africa so often, and I've been to Somalia, and I've worked with the United Nations, and I have understood not only the great struggle of the peoples in that continent with so much that overwhelms them, but just so often met people with the courage and the strength. So I want to be honored here tonight. I am also, in, in the final analysis, truly, truly stamped with uh, a moment of eternal joy of all my life. I wish daily to be able to share a platform with James Earl Jones. <laughs> I had no idea that you'd be cast in so humble a role. <laughs> As to sit there and speak those remarkable words about who and what I am, I could hardly hear them just for the fact that I knew that you were standing there saying it. <clears throat> I knew James's father, and I knew him, and I know him. What a great, great honor that he should have been willing to uh, 
extend me this honor tonight. To all of you who are here in support of John Jay College, I honor you. It's a good thing that you do this night, and I hope that you will continue to inform and to instruct and to help gather the resources that we're going to need in the future to help keep this great institution alive. And to my wife, who's here tonight, I'd like to just say thank you for getting me through yet another day. <laughs> and now, releasing you to do what is, I'm sure, having us all quite uh, anxiously hoping and wondering what will happen. First and foremost, of course, is will the Yankees win? <laughs> but not the least and the most important is our guy will come through tonight and give us another shot. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you.
please join me one more time in thanking all of the artists and musicians who helped us celebrate justice tonight. So our evening comes to a close. And on behalf of the extended John Jay community, I thank you for joining us tonight for this inspirational celebration of the lives of four champions of justice. Their work on the highest court of the land, in the killing fields of Somalia, in the prisons of America, in all the battle lines and the struggle for civil rights, reminds us that mortal human beings can change the direction of history. That, in the words of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., the arc of history may be long, but it always bends toward justice. So please leave here tonight with a firm resolve to do your part to bend that arc, to join the legions of people of conscience and commitment who are today's and tomorrow's fierce advocates for justice. So please join me in welcoming back to the stage tonight's honorees and their presenters for a final round of applause to show our respect and appreciation. Please, come up. Thank you all for coming. Have a wonderful and exciting evening with the events that lay ahead, and we hope to see you next year. Thanks so much.